And next up, uh, we have Rich Burrow uh, to talk on acid deposition. We're lucky to get him right before he retires, I think. So. Six more work days, not that I'm counting. <laughs> Acid rain. Acid rain was the environmental issue of the 1980s, period. Nothing else really was a close second place in terms of the way it dominated the literature and our respect, many of our respective scientific disciplines, captured the imagination of the popular press, the public, industry certainly got interested, environmental groups, Congress debated dozens of alternative solutions to the problem, and uh, Finally, this led up to, in 1990, the passage of the Clean Air Act amendments, which, for the first time, started to take a serious bite out of the sulfur and nitrogen oxides that were the root of the problem. Also in 1990, I think it led up to the formation, it was one of the motivating factors behind the formation of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. It was our experience in working on this issue that kind of brought us together and made it imperative that we understand each other's disciplines and data and the connections between the different components of the environment that we've been working on separately. And of course, it also led to the establishment of a, a large number of acid deposition monitoring networks in Vermont. Uh, this, these were only the eight that I could remember. I'm sure there are others in the room that can probably name a few more, but at one point in time, almost all of these different networks were operating at the Proctor Maple Research Center in Underhill. This was our strategy in the early days if we can just catch all the rain before it hits the ground. <laughs> How do I go to the next slide, Jim? Oh. I'm sorry. So I wanted to talk a little bit about data from one of these networks, um, the uh, National Atmospheric Deposition Program, National Trends Network, currently uh, composed of something like 263 sites, mostly in um, the continental United States, but also extending up into Canada, Alaska, and as far south as Argentina. The uh, green dots are the currently active sites, and the red ones are, have been unfortunately discontinued. And this trend, by the way, is increasing. We're seeing over time more and more red dots. We hope the red tide doesn't sweep against our shores any time in the near future. Um, we have two of these sites in Vermont um, in, the, in this network. One at the Proctor Maple Farm in Underhill that was established in 1984. A second one in Bennington near the water filtration plant there that was established in 1981. I'm just showing these here uh, on the back of the map. In the background is the precipitation volume um, from a recent year, uh, estimated by a very uh, sophisticated combination of measurements and model uh, calculations called uh, PRISM, which stands for Parameter Elevation Relationships and Independent Slopes Model. And uh, I, I, I put it in this context because I just wanted to, to point out that uh, uh, the, the uh, well, is this a pointer? The red that uh, we consider Bennington to be more or less representative of Lye Brook and, and Underhill to be more or less representative of deposition um, to the spine of the Green Mountains, but we know very well that it precipitates more as we go up in elevation, so what we're measuring is, is very much the low bound uh, um, <clears throat> of the concentrations. And the low bound is a great success story. Over the past 25 years that we've been looking, the pH of our precipitation is, has increased from the low fours to the low fives. That's incredible. That's close to an 80% reduction in the acidity of deposition across the state. Um, a few data details uh, to, to get into. In the early days, um, we can see that uh, generally uh, uh, Bennington concentrations of both sulfate and nitrate were higher than those in Underhill, and that sulfate uh, concentrations were substantially higher than nitrate uh, concentrations in the early days. And over time, a couple of things have happened. Bennington improved a little bit more rapidly than Underhill improved, and sulfate improved a lot more rapidly than nitrate improved, to the point 
where, and this is literally a point of conversion, where now Underhill equals Bennington and sulfate equals nitrate and everything equals 10. It's a nice round <laughs> number. And it's a lot better than 30, 40, 50 where we started. But who knew that this was going to be uh, the, 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 what, we, what we have observed over time. Another data observation is that uh, this happens to be for nitrate, and I've smoothed the data here into three-year averages so that the actual data don't get in the way of the story that I want to tell. But the, uh, we can see that the concentration in red has decreased, and the deposition, of course, has also decreased for nitrate, but that the concentration has decreased more rapidly than the deposition. The slope of the red line is steeper than the slope of the green line. The reason for this has been over this period of time, and of course, Leslie Ann was showing us a much longer period of record, but the precipitation volume has steadily been increasing on average, annual average, over that time period, making up for some of the benefits that we've seen from reducing the concentrations. Um, Another data observation, uh, nitrogen, total nitrogen deposition is getting a lot of attention lately. Um, and uh, both, not only nitrate, but uh, reduced uh, nitrogen in the form of ammonia, both have acidifying effects as they're processed through our ecosystems and both contribute, as well as they both contribute to uh, nutrient enrichment issues from both terrestrial and uh, aquatic ecosystems. So over time, as we've controlled the uh, emissions of oxidized nitrogen from cars, trucks, and power plants. That's come down nicely, but we haven't done anything to reduce uh, nitrogen emissions of ammonia, but largely from the agricultural sector, and whether we'll ever address that sacred cow or other chickens and pigs and so forth is uh, unknown, but that's actually been increasing over time to the point where now more of our total nitrogen deposition is coming in the form of reduced nitrogen. Another data added product that's become available recently through the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, and by the way, this is something we did in the VMC ahead of our time probably 20 years ago, not as well or as thoroughly or as comprehensively, but by combining the much more dense uh, information that we have of precipitation amounts through this PRISM model with the concentration fields coming out of the chemical networks, we can now provide estimates of deposition, not just at two locations, but everywhere throughout the state of all the various species that are measured um, with four kilometer resolution. And more recently, EPA has started to provide annual estimates of, uh, uh, of dry deposition, somewhat more coarsely gridded, uh, but also on an annual basis. And we can combine these two together and come up with estimates of our total uh, deposition, uh, again, with very high spatial uh, resolution. So this is this kind of the story. Um, by the way, I noticed a couple typos on my last two slides. These aren't actually nitrogen. I think this is nitrate. But nevertheless, this, this, is the, this is the success story. This is what basically happened during the 25 years that we've been making these measurements in Vermont, and uh, nitrate deposition and the sulfate deposition. And this is just a tremendous su uh, success, in my opinion. This is what happened on our watch and not only do we observe it, but a lot of people in this room have a lot to do with conducting the research, making the communications and the publications, arming our legislative uh, representatives and our lawyers with the necessary information that enabled the uh, controls to go in place that made this happen on our watch. So nice job, BMC, and keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs>